You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey guys, hey, welcome, welcome back to the podcast. It's Nikayla here. And today in the guest chair, I have Monique Little, who is the founder and CEO of the You Go Natural brand. Now, I first heard about this brand from my friend Chantel. Shout out to Chantel, who taught me about these awesome t-shirt buns that You Go Natural has where, you know, it looks like a pre-tied bun that you did yourself and you're able to just rock it. And this came in clutch for me, especially in my postpartum days. So I have been rocking them through workouts, through running to the store, anything I can think of, just lounging around the house, deep conditioning my hair, whatever you can think of. I have been so grateful for this brand and I'm so glad that I can finally have her in the guest chair. So a little bit about Monique. She got her fashion, she got her start in fashion retail as a teenager. She founded the company to address the need for easy styling options for women who opt to wear their hair in its natural state. And she started with a sewing machine, just using some leftover fabric that her mom has. And now in Going on six years, she has grown it into a multi-million dollar brand and she employs over 50 people, now 60 people and counting in Dallas, Texas. So let's get right into this episode to hear more about Monique's journey. All right. Hey, hey, Monique, how are you? (laughs) I'm good. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to just kick things off by learning a little bit more about you. So tell us, who is Monique? What was your first experience side hustling? So I'm Monique Little. I'm CEO of YGN. Um, I have always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit. So coming up, I love to just like make jewelry and sell it. When I was um, in college, I was selling jewelry online. I had a little Shopify store. Um, so it's always kind of been in me to be resourceful okay. and to have that entrepreneurial drive. That's so cool. I didn't know you had that shop during college. And what were you studying in school at the time? Were you studying fashion at all? Or what were your plans for postgrad? So I studied economics. I went to Rutgers University and okay. studied economics. I did take a couple of classes at FIT in New York. And post-grad, it was really, the goal was just to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> right. Relatable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, get a job that pays well. But it was really just a very uneventful <laughs> post-grad experience up until this right. point. So at what point, stage in your professional journey, did you say, you know what, I think I want to start my own business? Is that how it happened? Yeah. So um, shortly after I spent um, maybe it was like six years in corporate um, and shortly after having my daughter, um, I realized that I really wanted time to be home. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent some, I spent about six months home with her and then I went back, but um, I knew that I wanted more freedom in my schedule um, and more freedom to not only that, but to achieve things that it might have taken much longer to achieve had I tried to climb the corporate ladder. I'm sure a lot of moms can relate to this feeling. And for you, what were some of the first steps that you took once you had that realization? So the first step was to sort of act on some of the ideas that I had. I mean, I had been wearing my hair naturally since high school, which back then was kind of a novel thing. Like that was back when there were only a couple of of, um, products on the shelf that catered to uh, ethnic hair types, right? So I had been seeing how this community was growing all through these years. And I had these ideas for um, the holes that I saw in the market and things that just were not being addressed. Um, And so once I had a little bit of time, I was home, um, I just sort of acted on it. I I used some remnant fabric that my mom had in her closet, and I created these pre-tied head wraps, satin line head wraps, that really helped me to look good on the go uh, and didn't break off my hair or dry it off like a typical cotton head wrap would do. Um, And there was really just nothing on the market like it at the time. Uh, 
I had searched for it because I needed it for myself. <laughs> my, <Yeah. laughs> my, my daughter was super young and I just didn't have time to think about, oh gosh, I got to, it's wash day today. I got to spend right. a few hours doing my hair. I just didn't have time for it. Nope. Um, and so I needed to uh, create something for me. And then I ended up selling it to others. And it was um, interesting how it scratched an itch in the market and people really did respond to it. We sure did. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny that you say, oh, you know, I just picked up some material and I stitched it. Like most of us don't have a sewing machine lying around. And um, we, you know, even if we did, couldn't make this, you know, so it's so funny <laughs> that you say that so casually. Like I would probably have just taken, and I have just taken a random t-shirt or bandana and wrapped it around my head. So yeah. When you designed it, you had kind of a designer's eye and you, was it in the, was the prototype how it looks today with like the knot and the the turban, like pre-tied kind of formation, or was it a different version when you initially created it? So um, when I launched it, it was kind of around the time when um, head wraps were really becoming trendy. So mm -hmm. people were actually using the encore fabric more so than like the stretchy fabric at that time. So that's what yeah. I used at first. I okay. used Ankara fabric and I and I um and I sat and lined it. I tied these big fancy bows that are yeah. it's just not scalable to do anymore. <laughs> 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 and then I created all different types of styles that um mimicked what women were doing at the time. So when did you start selling them? While you were on maternity leave or once you got back to work? So while I was on maternity leave, I opened up the store and it was, you know, sales were trickling in. It was more than I would have expected had I, uh, without having any Facebook ads or anything like that. But it wasn't, obviously it wasn't enough to be a full-time income. Right. Um, so yes, then I went back to work and as it continued to grow, it really just didn't become sustainable to do both anymore. Uh, I was leaving work at my lunch hour to ship these things out in the mail, or I was sitting in my car, hand sewing <laughs> them together, <laughs> dropping them in boxes. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh gosh, I can't, I can't do both. And it right. got to the point where the store was making more than my salary. Uh, so wow. I just, it just made more sense to, to do it full time. Did it grow to that point where it was making more than your full-time job in that first year? Yeah, within the first six months, actually, it grew to that point. I've been putting them up on my Instagram and I had grown such um, engagement with the followers yeah. there and it really became a community. And every time I would drop a new color or a new print, people would rush to the store to buy. <laughs> Um, and in six months, it was just like, wow, like I would wake up in the morning and my husband and, and myself at the time would drive to work and I would look at my Shopify store and I'd be like, oh my goodness, like I made more before I wow. even got to work today than I'm going to make all day long. So <laughs> I just ended up, you know, saying, I'm just going to take the leap. And, and wow. I decided to quit my job and do it full time. <laughs> Did you ever expect it to take off so quickly? Not at all. No, it, it was not expected for it to take off so quickly. Now, I did know that um, because this this little idea had been like nagging at me for so long, I knew it was a good idea. <laughs> like I yeah. knew it was like something that had to exist in the world. Um, but I never, you know, before these opportunities open up to you, you just don't even know what's that's what it looks like, right? Like, right. I, I'm just kind of doing this thing that came to me and, it, you know, I'm along for the ride. Right. Um, but I, I don't know that I ever really thought of it becoming as big as it is. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's the beauty of side hustling. You know, you're able to start something and you don't put that pressure on it. Oh, it has to be this. It has to make this much in X amount of time. You know, right. that gives you that freedom to explore different patterns, to get some feedback from your customers. So were you getting feedback from the customers? Were things that people were saying to you? Was that helping to inform your next version of the product or your next pattern, your next design? 
Oh, absolutely. And that is our MO to this day is I always say, you know, there's this saying that says if you're not embarrassed by the first product you put out, you put it out too late. (laughs) (laughs) When I think back to the products that I put out, oh my gosh, I just want to apologize to my first (laughs) customers. (laughs) <laughs> because yeah. I mean, I just took the feedback and it, it's yeah. another funny story is I, I used to make them on these little styrofoam heads, the, um, okay. you know, like the little head forms. And I didn't realize that that's not the size of a real head. So these things were tiny, like absolutely. Yeah. Tiny. <laughs> and I was sending them to customers and they'd be like, Oh, I love it, but I just can't get it on my head. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't know those styrofoam heads were They're tiny not either. Actual head size. Yeah. <laughs> I just assumed they were. Um, so you know, those are learning experiences. I, I mean, there's it's there's a craft called millinery art. Oh, what's that? Uh, which is like the making of headwear. Um, okay. And that's an art form that is so rare that. I never studied um, and that, you know, most people don't know about, right? So there's Mm -hmm. all those things that go into making something that goes on your head or things that I have been learning as I go, learning as I interact with my customers and put new products out there. Um, And, you know, it's, it's the only way for me to understand what my customers need. So all this time, were you making all of these by yourself or did you also have a team or a few people that were helping you? So I started out doing it by myself um, it, for probably for the first four months or so. And it was me and this little uh, $40 sewing machine that I had um, <laughs> and a little bit of fabric. And then uh, my mother saw me doing it and she was like, do you need any help? Because my mother's the one who taught me how to sew. Okay. <laughs> so I think she reluctantly came mm-hmm. in and I have pictures and videos of us in her living room with just like fabric mm-hmm. everywhere and mm-hmm. like labels and at the time my sister was helping a ship and it was just like it had taken over her home um and so then it was me and her and then after that um i put up a craigslist ad and just put it up for a few seamstresses around the city um and they were working from home for me so what we would do is we would have we would take the orders um and then we would print out a spreadsheet and we would just divvy it up across like three or four people across town who would make them. Um, wow. and we would just <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> leave a little box of fabric at the door. They would come pick it up and they'd bring it back the next day made. And we mm-hmm. just pay them cash and then put the cash back wow. into the business. So that's how we scaled because it was an easy way to do it in a way that we didn't have to do a whole lot of manufacturing up front. Did that help you to be profitable? Just having low overhead and paying people, but you know, not really having full-time employees? For sure. It, I mean, it was the only way I could have done it. I didn't have yeah. a ton of capital to start up with. I didn't have much credit to start up with. It was the only way that I could have um, scaled a business to this size and not have taken the big financial risks up front. Yeah. So yeah, that was super helpful. I didn't even consider taking on full-time employees until a couple of years back when it really just became unsustainable to be doing it um, as I was. And what year did you leave your job? What? So I left my job in 2016, um, okay. about six months after I started. Yeah. So what happened next? Tell us, how did you go from side hustle to main hustle? I would say after I quit my job, I stayed home um, and started just working on the business. Um, There were moments where as I was growing it, uh, I I also needed to like have income to contribute to my family. So I was like driving Uber in the morning and then, you know, working on the business. But it was really just a grind for, I would say, about three years before I could just like do this and do this only. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's how I I grew it. It was really like I spent time just growing it with seamstresses across the city, like I told you. Um, And then last, well, in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, actually, I was we had since transplanted to Dallas. My husband's job transplanted us to Dallas. 
And I was working with manufacturers at at that point. Well, not manufacturers. Mm -hmm. I had some seamstresses and I had had a bad experience trying to transition to a manufacturer. Um, And I just realized that I just needed my own facility. Yeah. I I needed to be able to bring this in house and control all the pieces that were working together to make this business go. So I opened up a facility here in Dallas and I opened it up with like 2,500 square feet and like six people. And that unlocked. How how did you just open up? Like you just said that very casually. (laughs) How did you open up a facility? Like you're you're driving Uber, right? So I'm assuming that money is tight right now. So how do you go about even doing that? How, How does that process work? So, I mean, I wasn't driving Uber. At, I had been, I had stopped driving Uber maybe a couple years before that, right? Okay. So at this point, it's sustaining itself enough to know that for me to be able to step back and see where my limits were. Mm-hmm. And my limits were around meeting demand. Okay. So supply. <laughs> and it was really um, like, I, I can't make enough for these yeah. people for these customers. Like these customers are, are warning. Every time I, I release a batch, every time I, I send them out to a contractor and get them back, I release a batch, they're gone in half a day. And mm. I can't, it was hard to sustain that. And so having a team that was working here full time was just necessary. Um, now I won't say that I had a ton of money when I opened the facility cause I didn't, <laughs> I <laughs> did, it was pretty tight, but you know, I found a small space and a, I just like put the money down and I knew that there was enough revenue in the business to sustain that from month to month. Yeah. Because this is a lease. So you can, right. yeah. And talk to us a little about that supply chain, because I am so impressed when I see how people were able to pivot during that period. So you touched on, you know, you pivoted to mass while supply chain was held up. How long, you know, what was that process like of you having to do that and how did it impact you financially? Um, So it was about three months that we had to do that for. Um, Luckily, my product is pretty modular and the materials that we use to make them are readily available. Now, I'll, yeah. you'll probably pay a premium buying them not wholesale, because uh, uh-huh. sometimes I did have to go to our local fabric store and pick up fabric or what have you, because my supplier just didn't have any more left. So mm-hmm. I had to be creative about how I procured my materials and how I got them around that time. And it was really mm-hmm. difficult. But I, I have to say, because I had so much, I did have a lot of remnant fabric or leftover fabric. I was able to just utilize that as a resource and that mm-hmm. that pushed us through. So when you say your supplier, this is the person supplying the actual fabric, you know, that you don't use them to actually make your products. No. So I just I buy the raw materials. We keep them in house um, and we try to manage our inventory pretty closely. Yeah. So it's just sort of just in time as as much as the market demands okay. um, and we make it as we go. And I can relate to this um, on a small, small scale, you know, having uh, merchandise for the Side Hustle Pro Shop, right? So, you know, having to decide how much raw materials to have, even though you're not yet ready to put that on sale, is a it's a dicey process, especially when you want to make sure that your supplier doesn't sell out, right? So how do you manage that if people are asking for this color and then your supplier is out of stock of that color? Like, does that happen to you? How do you manage that? It does happen. I'll say last year we scaled up the business, um, I believe it was 700% last year. And because of that, like the amount of raw materials you have to buy to anticipate that kind of demand, yeah, you're bound to make some mistakes. And we did. We ended up yeah. with um, a lot of raw material inventory that, you know, we then had to be creative about offloading. And so this year is the first year where we've had that type of scale of data Mm -hmm. that we can forecast on going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're still learning that process. And I think that um, any business that is in a fast growth phase as we are is going to end up having to think about those things on the supply side. 
So guys, let's face it. The work world looks so much different than it ever has. Whether you're in person, remote, or in a closet like me, or somewhere in between, taking care of your team couldn't be more important. That's where Gusto comes in. Gusto's modern HR platform makes it easy to hire, pay, manage, and support your employees all in one system of record. That means no more jumping between applications and no more jumping through hoops. Your payroll, your benefits, your hiring and onboarding, team management tools, and so much more are all there for you in one convenient place. On top of that, Gusto provides actionable insights to inform decisions around workforce costing, competitive compensation, and employee engagement. So all those tough decisions you make each day just got a whole lot easier. And the best part? Listeners of Side Hustle Pro get three months of Gusto for free at gusto.com slash SHP. That's right. If you're ready to experience a new bar for HR, get three months free at gusto.com slash SHP. Gusto.com SHP. So what would you say, in addition to the supply management, what have been some of the parts that were unexpectedly challenging? I think the biggest challenge that I'm facing so far is is learning to manage a team as large as we have. So we started with the six people, but now we've got 60. Um, And most of them are on the production side. Uh, Mm -hmm. We've got a whole factory of people who make these products for us and just understanding how to create an organization that um, people are proud to come to every single day and enjoy mm-hmm. working at um, that meets their needs at just as much as they are, you know, meeting the needs of the business. Um, mm-hmm. That's been a challenge that I didn't really think that I would be facing, but it's yeah. it's it's an important one to to tackle. And how are you so far kind of navigating that? Are there books or um, resources or leaders that you've kind of tapped into to get a better sense of how do I create that culture that that essentially what you're describing is that that company culture? Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate to we raised money last year, so I'm fortunate to have a a network of people who have gone before and I can tap Mm -hmm. on for advice Um, But a lot of it is just the gut instinct of um, how would I want to be treated in in an organization? What are the good experiences that I've had in my past? What are the bad experiences that I've had in creating the best experience, best uh, work experience for the people who come here every day? Now, you mentioned raising money. So, of course, we want to touch on that because we know that our businesses at the end, like, at the end of the day, we all need capital to grow and scale. Um, so when did you decide to raise and why? So I decided to raise shortly after we moved into this facility. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was because it it was a good time as far as like how well we were doing. So we, okay. we I bootstrapped the business all the way up. We've been profitable from day one, right? So mm-hmm. um, once we got to a certain scale of a a million dollar run rate and things like that. Things that I knew looked good in the eyes of the VC and I could pitch easily and it wouldn't be difficult to tell that story. They always say, if you're going to raise money, do it when you don't need the money. So that's when, that's when I did it. We were doing pretty well um, and Mm -hmm. it was a good story to tell. So I decided to go out and tell it. Was it difficult to raise money from people who don't necessarily understand the need behind your product? Yeah. I mean, that was, it was an amazing eye-opening experience to yeah. be sitting across, um, well, across the Zoom at that point yeah. from people who looked nothing like me and trying to explain the Black woman's beauty experience. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> like not only is how it did like, you do that? Yeah. Right. It's it's not only that, I mean, men in general, I, I work with my brother now who is the COO yeah. of the company. He came on last year. He doesn't even fully understand it, right? He's a black man. So, you know, um, talking to, to to white men who, I mean, although well meaning, just yeah. have no context for the challenges. Um, mm-hmm. that um, women of color face in, in in beauty, it was, man, it was, it was an experience. And I'll say, you said, how do I, how did I do it? And it was 
mostly taking the story. I, I told the story over and over and over again, and that's what happens when you're pitching to yeah. um, VCs. But taking it and, and, and examining it to see where is the common ground here? Where mm-hmm. What is a universal story here? Um, and how can I make this as relatable to as broad an audience as possible so that we can connect and then we can go yeah. deeper on the nuance of this? Well, what did that look like for you? I mean, was it from the lens of womanhood? You know, um, every man who has a wife knows how their wife feels when she's not looking her best, perhaps, right? Like, so what what lens did you approach it from? Yeah, I mean, it was from the lens of womanhood. It was on from the lens of just time saved mm-hmm. um, and money saved. Um, I looked at it from the lens of when I was pitching, I only had the satin line turban products, but we've yeah. expanded since then. Yeah. Um, but just understanding that no matter what background you come from, the amount of time that women of color spend managing their hair on a day-to-day basis is sometimes inhibiting. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can somehow alleviate that on, in yeah. moments when there are other things that that need to take precedence or take priority, mm-hmm. you know, that's everyone knows what that's worth in, in their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what are some things that have shifted about your business since you started? Um, <laughs> I would say, oh, I'll, I'll say this for sure. Um, when I started, I... It was kind of like, of course, you're wearing all the hats when you're right. a solopreneur, right? Um, so there were a lot of decisions that I could just make on the fly and just go, right? You know, sales are low today. Let me run to the fabric store, pick up a new print. I'll put a sample online and just run a sale on it. Yeah. Um, that can't happen anymore when you have an entire team of people because everyone's looking around like, uh, what just happened? Like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like whiplash for them. So yeah. um, really, I, I'm I'm a very agile person and I, I like to be flexible in the way that I do business, but understanding that there are also structures and processes that need to be put in place in order for yep. things to um, scale with a team. And one thing I definitely want us to touch on is the marketing piece. So how important was this to you when you were starting out? What did you learn in the process about what was helpful for your business when it came to marketing techniques? Um, So in marketing, I I mean, I guess because I am, I am my market, um, just understanding that uh, the voice of what my customers want to hear um, and not straying from that Mm -hmm. uh, has been the most important thing in keeping our marketing on track, especially when we're bringing in partners that aren't as tied to the brand or it might not be as the voice might not be as intuitive for them. Understanding yeah. that the, it, keeping that voice is the most important piece of speaking to our, our customers. And then in terms of things like Facebook ads or social media posts, email list building, how did you approach that? What was helpful for you in scaling the business when it came to that? So I've got a great media spend team who runs our Facebook ads. They are incredible um and they come we go we come back every week every um week we have a call and just dig deep in the data Mm -hmm. um and uh just dig deep in you know how things have changed from this week to next and have those metrics and those kpis um so that's how we approach it is uh just making sure that every if we see a shift in any small piece of the data that we dig into why those things are happening um then make those adjustments on our end before you hired that media spend team um what were you doing on your own and when did you know it was time to bring in someone external um, so I was running Facebook ads on my own. I wasn't great at it at all, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they were profitable. I mean, yeah. the, the the satin line hair apps, at least when I launched it, was pretty unique. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really wasn't hard to acquire customers with it, mm-hmm. uh, and it wasn't expensive. I mean, yeah. when I came, when I did bring our data team on, our um, customer acquisition cost was, I believe, it was like. Um, a quarter of the average cost that they would see mm. in a typical e-commerce business. So, yeah. and even they were, they were, they 
checked and double checked the data over and over and over again because they didn't <laughs> like is this real yeah you know, like how is this happening that your cac is four dollars but you know you know your you know average order value was whatever number yeah. so those i did it and thankfully I, that was like a happy accident that that I, it was so profitable because yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think that's the beautiful part, though, of being your own target customer and having that vision, that understanding of what your pain point is, what you need to see, what would make you buy a T-shirt bun. And also your products, your Yugo Natural products, specifically the T-shirt buns for me are self-explanatory. Like when I see that and I'm like, oh, boom, I can get that cute not look without having to do it myself got it. I want it. Like, give it to me. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that is just awesome. But you did touch on the fact that now it's not as novel of a thing in terms of there are more than one company selling similar products for the natural hair community like that now, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your thought process when it comes to competition? A lot of people get daunted, intimidated by it, but I don't see you doing that. So what's your approach and, and thought process with that? Yeah. So, I mean, when I started this company, um, I would always tell, you know, the people around me that I don't want to sell head wraps for the rest of my life. Right. (laughs) I mean, I love them and I love how enthusiastic people are about them, but I have so many ideas to innovate in this market. And that is what we're selling here is innovation. Um, And so I, when, when people come behind and I mean, I don't want to say copy, but I mean, are inspired by what we do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, you know, it's nice and it's it's flattering, but the ideas that we have going forward, I mean, if you're constantly doing what we've done before, you won't be able to do what we're doing next. So, yep. (laughs) <laughs> You'll have to wait for you to do that thing to know what your next step is. Exactly. So <laughs> that is not something to worry about. So before right. we jump into the lightning round, I just really quickly wanted to know if you had the chance to start your company all over again from side hustle to full time, what would you do differently? I'm not sure. I mean, because I did make a lot of mistakes yeah. coming in, but I, I, that's how I learned how to run mm. the business. Um, and I don't know if that's a cop out, but it really is. <laughs> I mean, like I couldn't think of like, if I had done that perfectly before, right. would I still be here? Probably not, you mm-hmm. know? And, and um, the, the things that I learned along the way really helped me to know this business inside and out. Before we jump into the lightning round, one more thing, one more thing. I need to know. So what is next for you, Go Natural? Um, Okay. So, I mean, last year we released um, a bunch of product lines. We had, you know, Swim that came out, our um, water resistant turban. Yes. We had uh, our new silhouette of sleep, which is kind of an upgrade to your everyday bonnet. We did men's, which was kind of like a side idea that took off. It's been crazy. Um, And so last year was really our e-commerce product year. And we're looking to probably move away from product focus um, and move more so into consumables. So. We'll see. Um, I won't give away all the secrets. You'll have to give it all away. We will watch (laughs) in anticipation. A lot more to come. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to jump into the lightning round. You just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Number one, um, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Um, I would say uh, the women's, whatever women's development center is in your city. Um, Mm -hmm. I used the one in Philadelphia pretty early on and they helped me um, sort of get 
resources for marketing, accounting, um, mm-hmm. even a small, it was like a small $2,500 loan I took from them. Um, they were an amazing resource for me as I was, as I was building the business. Oh, awesome. Number two, what's been the best business book or conference or um, podcast episode that you've consumed this year? I reread Shoe Dogs this year, which is the autobiography or the memoir of the Nike. Nike. Yeah. yeah. And I love that story because um, it kind of makes me not feel so bad when I'm in like crazy chaotic <laughs> situations. It shows like as you grow, you're always going to be running into these moments uh, where mm-hmm. you have to think on your feet. So I love that book. Okay. Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your day? Right now it's coffee. <laughs> I am um, I'm expecting a child. It used to be wine at the end of the night, but it's not uh, wine right now. It's okay. Well, morning. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, number four, what is a personal habit that you feel has helped you significantly in business? For me, it's been making to-do lists and managing my calendar. Um, Mm -hmm. Just because, I mean, uh, the number of things that end up falling on your plate on a day-to-day basis as a CEO, an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. um, there's no way to keep track of it if you don't don't manage a list or manage a calendar. And then number five, last question is, what is your parting advice for fellow Black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss but are scared of losing that steady paycheck? I would say take the first step and it doesn't necessarily, that first step doesn't necessarily mean quitting your full-time job, but take that first step and then take the next one. Um, and you know, it'll take you where it needs to take you if you're continuously working on it. Um, Mm -hmm. as long as you're not giving up, it's going to have to think that's just the way life works. It's going to have to move forward. Uh, so just take the first step and then take the next one and, and try to manage things as it feels natural for you and your family. All right, Monique. So where can people connect with you after this episode? Um, you can find the essence of Yugo Natural on Instagram at Yugo Natural, Twitter at YGN Raps, and we mm-hmm. are on TikTok. Please follow us there at okay. Yugo Natural. And you can also um, see our full product line at www.yugonatural.com. All right, guys. So thank you, Monique, for being in the guest chair. It was a pleasure having you. And there you have it, you guys. I will talk to you next week. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six foot Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you'll receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.